All right, let's get it, Jordan Peterson. Anyway, Jordan Peterson announced today, I think, that he has resigned from his position as a full tenured professor at University of Toronto. So he has left a tenure track position at the University of Toronto. Now, you know, a lot of times that's a big deal because, you know, it's a, it's a sweet job to have as a, as a tenured professor. Jordan Peterson doesn't need the money, so it's, it's not an issue of money for Jordan Peterson. Um, but it, it is, you know, it's, it's pretty noteworthy. Uh, Jordan is, he's not even 60. God, that makes me feel terrible. So Jordan Peterson is actually um, younger than I am. Go figure. Jordan Peterson is younger than I am. Um, uh, cause I'm 60 and he, he hasn't turned 60 yet. So he must be 59. Anyway, for somebody 59 to leave a tenure track position at a university, why? It's, it's, a, it's an amazing job. You can be fired from it, basically. I mean, you have to rape a student to be fired. Uh, you, you get to teach. You get to engage with young people. We know uh, probably from watching Jordan, from the videos, that he loves teaching. Uh, and, uh, and it's a tragedy for somebody as able as competent, as engaged as Jordan is in teaching and with students, to see him leave the university at, at a relatively young age, usually professors hang on well into their 70s and 80s. Um, but, uh, but, but they have it. You know, I don't know how old Jordan Peterson is. Just in, in, in his words, he says, I am now Professor Emer Emeritus. And before I turned 60, so uh, that means he hasn't turned 60 yet. So uh, it's, it looks like he's about a year younger than me. Um, so the question is, why did Jordan Peterson leave academia? Why did Jordan Peterson quit the University of Toronto? Because it's clear he loved his job. It's clear he loved teaching. It's clear he loved the students and the interaction between them. So what is it that caused him to uh, leave the job? It's, it's not health-related. It's not, uh, you know, because, again, according to Jordan Peterson, let me just be clear before I say anything else. I don't know what happened at the University of uh, Toronto. I don't know w the politics of this, if there are any politics of it. I don't know if there was pressure on him to resign. I don't know if the fact that he took a year leave to deal with his health issue was an issue. I don't know any of this stuff. I am basically assuming that everything Jordan Peterson has written in this article that he wrote is true. I have no way to verify it otherwise or to challenge it. So I'm just going to go with the article uh, as it is. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll use that. According to Jordan Peterson, uh, he resigned. He was not forced out. Uh, and he, uh, he, he, it was not a health issue. It was not any uh, reason other than he decided to resign for the following reasons. All right. By the way, given that we're so far behind in terms of uh, just the, the, the Super Chat, try and do $20 questions um, just because I'm not going to do a very long show and that, that's one way that we can get there quickly. Anyway, so why did he resign? He's saying, look, so this is his first reason. It basically, he gives two reasons. The first reason he says he's training students Many of these students are heterosexual white men. And he says the fact is that they have a negligible chance of getting a job today in academia. Uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. It's usually diversity, equity, and inclusion. But he likes to call it diversity, inclusion, and equity because that spells out die which he obviously likes, um, basically rules out the possibility of hiring non-minority uh, faculty members. Now, again, I don't know how accurate this is, but it sounds from everything we're reading about woke, it sounds like it's bad. Now, to some extent, this has been true for a long time, right, for decades, departments and universities and schools have tried to create diverse faculty and focused on hiring minorities. I, I think I've told you the story that when I was uh, being interviewed by uh, Santa Clara University 
and and before they offered me the job, they, you know, one of the, it's a whole ugly story of, of, of um, you know, my attempt to get a job at Santa Clara, ending with the idea that the Jesuits didn't want to hire me because there were too many Jews in the finance department. But before we got to the fact that they didn't want me because I was Jewish, uh, they, they made an offer to every minority that was on the market possible, particularly this one woman who was black, and they figured they'd score twice. They get a woman and black. She landed up going to Ohio State, so she she kind of snubbed them, um, and that's what made it possible for me to get an academic job after 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 all, because all these other people got even better paying jobs at better universities, Ohio ranked universities, um, uh, uh, which left the opening for me to ultimately get. And once we overcame the reluctance to hire another Jew, um, so. Universities for decades now have been trying to create these diverse environment, but it hasn't been, in a sense, a religion. It hasn't been we hire minorities on nobody at all. It hasn't been at the kind of pace and at the level and at the kind of attitude that exists today. Um, so... Today, uh, they are, it is very difficult, unless you're one of these minorities, to actually get an academic job. More difficult than it has, than it was even in the past, where already it was, it was a challenge. Today, it's even more difficult to do so. So he's saying, look, I, you know, it doesn't seem right to train these students, to invest so much in these students, when they're not going to get a job. There's just no hope for them. It's depressing. And it's not right. But there's nothing I can do within the system to change that. He goes on to say that one of the reasons his students in particular are unlikely to get jobs is because they are his students. That in a sense, he thinks that there's a certain blacklisting going on out there in the profession around him and his students. So that if somebody gets their graduate degree working under Jordan Peterson, nobody's going to hire them because of Jordan Peterson, because he's so shunned uh, by the profession, and he says, uh, and this isn't just some inconvenience, these facts render my job morally untenable. And I understand that in, in a sense of training graduate students, right? He could quit training graduate students and just teach undergrads. He likes teaching undergrads. You can tell it again from his performance in class. But to him, uh, this is a key point. The second issue, so this is reason number one, his graduate students can't get jobs because they're his and because some of them at least, the ones who are white and male, just can't because they're white and male. Second reason, he says, is because he is just appalled and disgusted by the ideology that he believes is currently destroying universities and ultimately if they destroy the university, destroying the culture and he just doesn't want to be part of it anymore. He's saying that this whole woke attitude, the whole idea of only hiring BIPOC, I, I don't know what BIPOC, BIPOC is black, indigenous and people of color into positions is, is unbelievably destructive. It's unbelievably destructive when done in universities and it's unbelievably destructive outside of universities. And, 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 and I think his analysis here is, is, uh, is, very, is good, it's telling. I, generally, I think this essay that he wrote, he wrote this, I should, I should give you the reference. He wrote this today, from what I can tell, yeah, January 19th. So yesterday, he wrote this yesterday. Um, 
for the Toronto, for the Toronto, no, for the National Post, for the Canadian National Post. Uh, and it's titled Jordan Peterson, Why I'm No Longer a Tenured Professor at the University of Toronto. And it's very good. It's very, you know, there's a, I would edit it, but, you know, in terms of the content, I think it's very good. He, he, he goes off, he, he, he's explaining what the consequences of common hiring practices are going to be, not just at the university, but culture-wide. He says, uh, universities are hiring people that are unqualified. They're bringing people into graduate programs that should not be there. They're hiring, uh, they've, uh, you know, universities are doing away with objective testing, in other words, uh, tests. Uh, more and more universities are, are announcing that they're doing away with testing uh, in, in deciding uh, who to uh, admit to the university. This is true both in the undergraduate and at the graduate level. Um, uh, this means that we're not necessarily getting the most highly quality people, students. They're being admitted into these programs more on the basis of their race, gender, sexual identification, whatever. And as a consequence, there's a real possibility that we're just, they're not qualified. It's not true that everybody can learn everything. For example, there's a real need to know and to understand and to be able to analyze and to be able to do uh, pretty sophisticated statistics. We've talked about this on this show many, many times. In order to analyze healthcare data, to analyze psychological data, a lot of these professions now rely on data collection. Now, whether they should rely on so much data collection or not is a different question, but the fact is that the field today is very data reliant, and yet many of these students don't know and are not smart enough at the end of the day to get a lot of this stuff. He says other professors, his colleagues in the admissions, you know, the, 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 the committees that admit students, the committees that hire new professors, they all craft DIE statements to obtain research grants, they all use DIE as a standard to hire and to, and to bring people in. They, they don't believe in this stuff. They don't believe in DIE. They don't believe in this diversity, insanity, this equity idea. But they do it anyway. They just, because they feel like if not, they're going to be shunned. They're going to be ridiculed. They're going to get into trouble with administration. They're going to get into trouble with students. They even allow themselves to be submitted, as Jordan Peterson writes, to these unbelievable anti-bias training conducted by unqualified people to try to get rid of biases that are implicit, that it's not clear that exist. And it's not clear, it's pretty clear that these trainings won't get rid of them. They're all, the whole purpose is to induce guilt in you and to use guilt and doubt in you. You know, it, 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 these are the test for implicit biases. They, I'll put it mildly, the object, objectivity has been challenged. Objectivity has been challenged. I mean, if you get rid of objective testing, if you get rid of uh, all the testing for graduate school and you just let everybody in. I mean, this is going to have a terrible effect on students, on the profession, on research, on study, and professors of the future. If you hire anybody, not because of their ability, not because of their skill, you're guaranteeing a lowering of standard, a lowering of quality. Now, uh, now even once you get a degree, Peterson writes, uh, the uh, accreditation bodies for clinical psychology now require, will only accredit university clinical psychology programs if, this, if they 
have a social justice orientation. So schools have to do this, otherwise they're not going to get accredited. So accredited bodies won't accredit the students. So it's useless to get a degree if you can't then work. I mean, this is the whole evil of licensing and, and the way it works. And, and on and on and on, you know, social justice, wokeism, however you want to call it, is everywhere. And it's infiltrating not just the humanities, it's infiltrating, we've talked about it, infiltrating medicine, it's infiltrating discipline after discipline after discipline. And Jordan is basically saying, you know, he doesn't want to be part of the system. He doesn't want to be a part of sanctioning all of this. You know, he says, he writes here, what exactly, just exactly what am I supposed to do when I meet a graduate student or young professor hired on DIE grounds? Manifest instant skepticism regarding their professional ability? What a slap in the face to a truly meritocratous, uh, uh, meritorious, sorry, meritorious young outsider. He's right. I mean, you can't, if you meet somebody who's black, a minority, you can't assume they're incompetent. But the doubt exists because of why they were hired. So it, it creates this ridiculous situation in which you want to treat individuals as individuals, but you can't ignore the fact that they've not been hired because of their individual ability. I mean, he says this, and, and this is great. This is a really, really good sentence. The DIE ideology is not friend to peace and tolerance. It is absolutely and completely the enemy of competence and justice. I love that. It is absolutely and completely the enemy of competence and justice. And that's really what's happening. You're getting a reduction in competence and you're getting massive injustice. People not hired that should be hired, people getting hired that shouldn't be hired. Um, I'm going to give you, sorry, I'm going to give you a link in the chat here and I'll include a link, I'll include the link in the, um, under the, under the video, I'll include a link, but there's, uh, I just put the link in the chat for those of you interested in finding the article. Um, now this is not just in academia, uh, as I think, you know, the Oscars now, um, are going to be, uh, balanced, not just by ability and skill and artistry and all of that, but by the color of the skin of the person who made it. It's going to be balanced and it's going to, prizes are going to reflect the diversity of the moving going audience, but this is not just in terms of prizes. According to an article published on Barry Weiss's blog, uh, Substack, uh, this is the author writes, quote, we spoke to more than 25 writers, directors, and producers, all of whom identify as liberal, and all of whom describe a pervasive fear of running afoul of new dogma. How to survive the revolution by becoming its most ardent supporters. Suddenly, every conversation with every agent or head of content started with, is anyone BIPOC attached to this? You, you want a hit show? It's not going to be a hit if the writing's great. It's not going to be a hit if the acting's great. It's not going to be a hit if the direction's great. It'll never be made. Nobody will ever invest in it unless it's got a diversity quota. I mean, this is sick. It's racist. CBS, for example, according to Jordan, has literally mandated that every writer's room be at least 40% BIPOC in 2011, 50% in 2022, not 2011, 2021. I mean, this is real racism. And this only penalizes people of ability who don't happen to have the right skin color. It's a racist policy against people of ability. And of course, again, even if you have ability and you happen to have the right skin color, 
Now, people are going to question whether you're there because you really have ability or whether you're there because of your skin color. So it encourages racism. It encourages right, uh, uh, doubt. It encourages skepticism and discrimination in every direction. I mean, skin color, gender, gender, ethnicity, race, sexual preferences is now the most important qualification for study, research, and for employment in a variety of different fields. And then on top of that, this has been brought into the business world through the ESG movement, environment, social and governance scores. ESG scores, uh, uh, Jordan says, are like the social scores in China. It tells you whether a company is, has social justice as part of it, whether its hiring practices are okay, whether it, 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 it quote, treats the environment appropriately, whether it has the right number of minority on its board of directors, whether it hires the right people, whether it gives people enough leave, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, pregnancy leave, birth leave, whatever is sexy and popular these days. And ESG now pervades American business. It's everywhere. We've talked about this on the show. Investors now use these ESG scores to decide who to invest with and who not. And CEOs are falling over each other to try to raise the ESG score you know, to appeal to the investors who are using the score. Again, nobody believes this. Maybe a few people like, like the CEO of BlackRock, but nobody believes in this stuff. But they believe they have to believe. They believe they have to act as if they believe. They believe it's a requirement now of their job to play into this. So CEOs who are, don't give one iota about DIE or about ESG or about any of these socially justice issues play into this advocate for this change their corporate policy in order to accommodate this because they think this is what the world is demanding of them and just as Ayn Rand said the sanction of the victim they're willing to sanction all this in the name of peace and leave us alone and let us do our job but of course nobody's going to let you do your job every aspect of your business is going to be regulated and controlled based on these kind of criteria you're feeding this, you CEOs. I give, I give uh, Jordan a lot of credit for going after CEOs. This is what he writes. For shame, CEOs signaling a virtue you don't possess and shouldn't want to please a minority who literally live their lives by displeasure? You're evil capitalists after all and should be proud of it. At the moment, I can't tell if you're more responsibly timid, sorry, if you're more reprehensibly timid even than the professors. They are more reprehensibly timid than the professors. The professors have limited wealth, limited prospects. The professors, uh, uh, you know, are detached from the real world in some fundamental sense. They're beholden to their theories and ideologies and to the abstract knowledge that they have or lack of knowledge that they have. CEOs are more worldly. They know. They know the consequence of this nonsense. They know what is going on in the world. They know how this hurts their business. They have the wealth. They have the power. They have the voice to be able to change it. But what don't they have? They don't have the courage. They don't have the moral conviction. They don't have the will to stand up to the intellectuals, to stand up to the purveyors of evil ideas, to stand up to the professors and tell them, no, garbage. We're going to run our business to make money. We're going to run our business in a way that maximizes our profitability, our shareholder wealth. We're not going to succumb to this nonsense, this anti-reality, anti-profit, anti-human life ideology. We're just not going to do it. The businessmen of all the people are the ones who can afford to do it most. 
and are ones who I know are the most skeptical about this nonsense. So it's tragic to see the sanction of the victim. It's tragic to see businessmen succumbing to this. But this is the power of ideas. When you have bad ideas, when altruism is your guide, when who is most in need has a moral claim against you, when you've given up on reason, when you've given up on justice, real justice, when you've given up an ability, and when the moral standard is how much we can sacrifice the able to the not able, how much we can sacrifice to those who claim the most grievance, claim the most need. It, it, it is all lost. What we're seeing today is the left embracing this form of altruism. And taking it to its nihilistic, anti-life, necessary conclusion. We don't care if you can actually build that. We care what color skin you have. We don't care if you can actually cure this patient. We care what color skin you have and what color skin they have. We don't care about human life. We don't care about happiness. We don't care about prosperity. We don't care about success. We care that the people we define as needy are sacrificed too. What we want really deep down with DIE, with ESG, with social justice has always wanted is to tear down the able. It's to tear down the successful. It's to tear down the rational. It's suddenly to tear down the egoistic. It's to destroy. It's nihilism. There's no value here. So kudos to Jordan Peterson for quitting. Kudos for writing an essay explaining it. It can only go so deep because Jordan can only go so deep. Um, he can only explain these phenomena as... as you know, uh, maybe a psychological, but here as, as just cultural phenomena, he doesn't go deep into what brings them about. He certainly doesn't understand the causal relationship between altruism and about what's going on in the world today. Um, but what we're living today is, is the consequence of Kant, Hegel, Marx, Frankfurt School, postmodernism, and the woke um, is the nihilism of young people, the nihilism of our professors, and the cowardice, the moral cowardice of our business leaders is all a consequence of that. Ideas drive the world for better or for ill. All right. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Your Own Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.